Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Thirty acres of land, forty thousand square feet, thirty bedrooms, two hundred years old. Rise Hall is home for Sarah, husband Graham, and their three kids. We had our wedding here, and it's been a happy place. But this romantic dream has now become a real nightmare. A house like this is a money pit because it's on the brink of collapse. I didn't think there was a woodworm in this area. Rise Hall needs saving fast. This is a building in crisis. It would be a terrible shame to lose it. Over the next three weeks, we'll follow Sarah and husband Graham as they attempt to save Rise from ruin and transform it into a top wedding venue. This is great. The first wedding is only eight months away. We can achieve this. Let's hope so, eh? Because we're going to look right, chumps. <laughs> can the queen of TV property save this 200-year-old stately stack and finally make it pay for itself? If it doesn't get finished, we're in serious trouble. Nestled between Hull and the coast, Rise Hall is a Georgian jewel in the East Yorkshire countryside. For the past decade, it's played home to Sarah, her hubby Graham and their ever-expanding clan. It's a place where the kids can go a little wild and mum and dad can kick back and relax. Graham always said that if we bought a stately home, he'd marry me. So I thought, well, we better get a stately home, then he could marry me. And he did ask me to marry him on the roof up at the top of here. It was great, actually. He said, there's a lovely sunset, let's go and sit on the ridge. And we sat on the ridge. I was a bit shocked when he actually asked me. It's one of those things you think, blimey, gosh, you've actually done it. We had our wedding here and we thought it was amazing. And it was the romance of it. Ultimately, we wanted a house with columns and steps up to the front door and a big staircase. Rise Hall is huge. 97 rooms in 30 acres of land. But they got it for a song, £430,000, about the same price as a suburban semi in London. We were quite happy to live in this in a slightly bohemian way, which is what we do, and it wasn't... It was, it, it was built to be lived in. Yeah. Do you like the big house, boys? Yeah. What's your favourite thing about the big house? Um, champagne. I'm very high. You can scoot round it. But it's not a museum. I think that's the other thing, is that a lot of these houses are treated like museums. It was built as a home, and we wanted it to be a home. Yeah, I, there, there was also a friend of ours who said, you, you just don't do that sort of thing. You live in a flat until you have children, and then you go and buy a slightly bigger house. And we thought, no, we bloody don't. We're going to go and buy this dirty great thing that you're telling us not to. I think there was, I think there was a bit of bloody mindedness. We've got the best view in East Yorkshire, I should think. It's absolutely beautiful here. And there isn't really anything wrong with it apart from the condition. Yes, the condition. Like many of Britain's stately homes, it's falling into the ground. Built in 1815, it's nearly 200 years old. Made up of two floors, its front third, the part that Sarah and her family stay in, is in need of serious refurbishment. The rest just gets worse. For years I've advised people on Property Ladder as to what they should do and... I mean, the first thing I'd probably say if I turned up here and I was a contributor on Property Ladder is you shouldn't have bought it. And I'd be right, we shouldn't have done, but, you know. If Sarah and Graham don't start restoring Rise fast, it could quickly go the way of Uffington House in Lincolnshire that went from this to this in just a very few years. To help with the rescue, Sarah has recruited an army of local tradesmen.
It's a massive job. Rotting fixtures to be ripped out, treacherous floors to be fixed, the to-do list is almost endless. And Sarah's putting her family, her finances and her reputation on the line. Failure, as they say, is not an option. I know I'm incredibly lucky, amazingly fortunate, and, and most people would consider me to be kind of successful, but I still have to get it right. I mean, there's no bottomless pit of money there. This, this is costing a fortune and, and could easily take us down financially. Has the Queen of Property Development finally bitten off more than she can chew? What do her workforce think? We don't know how much experience Sarah's had with a big project. Three bedroom semi or whatever, it's not this sort of thing. It's, it's a big job and it needs somebody who's experienced. And whether she's got that experience or not, I just don't know. We've got electricity there anyway. Well, even Sarah said herself, this, would, this should be a two-year project. So trying to cram it into, what, what was it, eight, six, seven months? Saving a house like Rise should cost millions, but Sarah doesn't have anywhere near that kind of cash. And even if she did, the price of the restoration would be far more than the final value of the finished property. So she's going to use every trick she knows to deliver the project on budget. For a start, Sarah's going to manage it herself, and not from Rise Hall, but from her base in London. Assuming nothing goes horribly wrong, project managing this from 200 miles away will save us a lot of money. With both time and money being tight, can Sarah and her restoration army save Rise and be ready for that all-important first wedding? Sarah Beanie has set her sights on saving this historic and crumbling stately home and turning it into a top-flight wedding venue. This is a building in crisis. It would be a terrible shame to lose it. To cover restoration costs and keep the house running, Sarah and Graham have to get Rise to start paying for itself. But to turn it into a stunning wedding venue, they're going to have to overhaul the front hall and give it the spectacular factor that'll impress any couple contemplating getting hitched at Rise. and the real fun begins inside. For the weddings, people will come through this front door into this area where they can have their champagne and drinks and, and have a very glamorous time. It'll be a much nicer room because the main thing we're doing in here is to repaint it, but it's a bit of a bigger job than just uh, any old lick of paint. The largest reception room will be the centerpiece for functions at Rise Hall and these sweeping stairs will become the perfect place for wedding photos. If you think about the fact that you could probably fit two terrace houses in this one room, there's a lot of scaffold that needs to go up. A lot of scaffold, a lot of paint. <laughs> and the final reception room is somehow going to turn from a games room into something a lot more illustrious. So in here, uh, we're going to have this uh, a more contemporary room. It'll be painted in contemporary colours and it'll be our modern art gallery. Leaving the reception rooms, guests will then be asked to make their way through the middle third of the house en route to the main function hall at the back. You may need to use your imagination here. This is the final approach down to the great hall where wedding receptions will be taking place. And, um, as you can see, it's fantastic. It's, it's dark. <laughs> I mean, we have to do something about this. Not only do we have to paint it, you know, you, you have to make it a nice walkway down and not just feel like an enormously large, dark corridor. And down the end of the enormously large, dark corridor is a remnant of Rice Hall's years as a convent school for girls. This sports hall, a fine example of 70s architecture, sits rather unpleasantly on the end of the grand old building. 
This area isn't part of the original building. It, it was built in the 1970s when it was a school, and this is the entrance going into the sports halls. What's quite hilarious is this is all 40 years old, and the rest of the house is 200 years old, and you can see what a shocking state this bit is in. Sarah could have considered knocking it down and starting all over again, but that would have been completely budget-busting. And there's a sentimental reason, too. We actually had our wedding in here. Got fond memories of it. See, we think it's fabulous, as it is. But anyway, it's very good for playing football at the moment and badminton, but, um, but not great for weddings. So we're going to change the windows. So it's a question of making it watertight, dry, heated. Yeah. You won't recognise it, I absolutely assure you. The other thing that you do have to think about is that you know, if they loved all the rest of the house and then they come through here, if it isn't good enough, people aren't going to get married here. And all this money that we're spending is for no purpose. Transforming the sports hall isn't the only makeover miracle they need to perform. On the top floor, there are one or two habitable family bedrooms, but at the moment, there's nowhere for a wedding party to spend the night. So here we've got, um, we're going to have two bedrooms here and a bathroom. This is uh, what happens if you don't use a house. It's just a mould that's in the air and um, you end up with this. Lovely. She may be Sarah Beanie, but even she's going to struggle to convince anyone that this dank, damp disaster area can be transformed into the place to spend your wedding night. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like a contributor on Property Ladder. <laughs> I'm kind of like, hmm, yeah, we can do up this enormous stately home with 30 bedrooms yeah, in six I'm... months. That's no problem. And we've only got a budget of £3.50. I'm quite a lot more <laughs> nervous now that I'm looking at it, actually. We can achieve it. You can achieve anything if you try hard enough. Rice Hall has had many uses in the last 200 years. For the first 125 years of its life, it was the family home of the Bethels and the scene of a fair few aristocratic knees-ups. During the Second World War, it served as a hospital, and after that, it became the St Philomena Convent School for Girls, who looked like they forgot to clear up after themselves when they moved out in 1989. After that, it was left to rot, until young lovebirds Sarah and Graham took pity on it and bought it from a particularly interested estate agent. At the time, I was the chairman of the Georgian Society for East Yorkshire, so I had a particular interest in this building, which is, after all, one of the most important in the county. I was really particularly thrilled at the idea of somebody who was mad enough to take it on as a private house and do the place up, and I think it's fantastic that Rise is going to earn its keep in a way that it probably has never earned its keep since the day it was built. Although Sarah wants to bring the house into the 21st century, there are some old customs she's desperate to keep alive. Throughout its long history, Rise has employed countless local people in a myriad of jobs. And Sarah wants to keep this tradition going, so she's hired local folk like Jeff the Roofer to help her save the hall. It is a very... Very good place to work, very handy. Yeah, it's nice, not like work sometimes. Not when you're living, working in a place like this. It's a beautiful place. When I first came, it was still a girls' school. It's gone from being a home to being a convent and it's back to a home. But uh, soon with the wedding venue, which will be good. Good to see it up and running again. I've got the income coming off it and Gary, my oldest son, He's got his income coming off it as well, which there's quite a bit of work wants doing. Well, it is a big project to do in a short space of time, but it's just a, it's a nice project. It's bringing, obviously, a nice building back to life kind of thing, so... Trying to restore Rise is going to require a huge amount of man and heavily pregnant woman power. Oh, oh that's hard work. That Here, let me a bit, have a go. a bit tricky. <laughs> 
But Sarah's got to be careful with the sledgehammer because Rise is full of hidden historical treasures that have been obscured by pupil-proof plasterboard for the last couple of decades. There's a fireplace. That's so cool. How brilliant. Genuine Regency wallpaper. How about that? Do you think it's as... Yeah, well, it would be, because the Victorians put... Yeah, that's, a, that's an historical fact. I don't think it's really old, but it's very pretty. I think my mother had wallpaper like that when I was a child, which is why So I... it's not really old, it's 1970s. Yeah, it so. probably is. We really only have the originals in places like this, where they've come along and just put a, another floor down because the floor heights weren't right. And so we've got loads of this sort of space going on. Maybe they wanted a place for rats to live. And it's not only the house that needs to be overhauled. The grounds have to be picture postcard perfect too. This is very much Graham's gig, but he's got big welly boots to fill as the original landscaping of Rise was done by the 17th century master gardener Capability Brown. Undaunted, Graham wants to restore this muddy hole in the ground into a beautiful pond teeming with fish. Take, take the corners off it more, so have it a bit more, you know, a sort of semicircle ending rather than it's quite square at the moment, isn't it? You want it to as far out as that, then, aren't No. We're reducing the size of this a lot. In the 17th century, this would have taken weeks, but with diggers costing a fortune, Graham has got just one day. Could you say good morning? Right. Say hi. This is Nick, Billy, Charlie. Are you all right? Look, they've given you a hat. <laughs> yeah, wow! <laughs> that is so cool. It's a big one. Jeez, look at the size of that. It's caterpillar. It's called a caterpillar. Do you think it'll turn into a butterfly? <laughs> it's a caterpillar digger. It's a caterpillar digging, all right, honey. You just hope that it doesn't all go pear shaped. It may be costing a small fortune, but Sarah's convinced it's worth all the work. It's amazing to think that, fingers crossed, a bit of luck, following wind, it's going to be a bride and groom coming down this drive, and it will be beautifully landscaped and not a pile of mud. I know this is a little bit cheeky. Would you, um, I just, I, I have to drive one of the diggers. Would you mind? No. It just seems a bit unfair that you have all the fun. <laughs> OK, so what do I do? All right. Yep, cool. Pull that lever back. <laughs> this way. This is great. I want to go. You can't. It's my choice. I just want to be a digger driver. This is brilliant. That's, that's quite a lot achieved in one day. Not bad for 1,500 people, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Put enough people and enough diggers and you can achieve amazing things. It'll take months for the pond to fill and grass to grow, but today has proved to Sarah and Graham that together they can achieve incredible things. Graham has dreams and I make it happen. It's a dangerous partnership, really. But the pond is only the first small step in the right direction. The biggest threat to their dream is very small. Dry rot spores. The rot is systematically eating its way through the house, room by room, destroying walls and woodwork. The big problem with dry rot is that it's, it runs behind plaster work. It takes all the moisture out of the wood. It drinks wood, so it takes the moisture out of the wood, which means that the wood loses its structural integrity, all needs to be taken out and burnt and then replaced. The damp, moist conditions may be terrible for weddings, but they're perfect for dry rot. Well, this is live dry rot. Obviously, something here has been weeping, so it's a nice damp patch that it's just had a really good chomp on. It's kind of amazing stuff. If you look, it's sort of... This is live dry rot. 
The only way of treating dry rot is you have to remove the source of the moisture. You've got to stop it being wet. That is the most important thing. Sarah and Graham have literally got to stop the rot and stop it fast. And the only way to do that is to make the whole house watertight. A massive job. It's clear the roof needs attention, but surprisingly, one of the major sources of moisture in Rise is the rotting sash window frames. We've got 149 sash windows on the main house here. They've been neglected over the years and they're in a terrible, terrible state. It's a huge, huge job. When we bought this place, I should think none of these windows have been painted for 20 years. They can deal with a certain amount of weather, just not 20 years worth of no painting. If you look at this window here, actually it doesn't look so bad in this section, but under the paint, it's just, there's nothing there that, it's completely and totally, this is like cotton wool in here. Actually, you can go right through to the other side. So you can see me coming in the other side, look at that. Hello. <laughs> All 149 frames will need replacing. And at a grander window, that's 149,000 quid. Money they just can't spare. But Sarah has tracked down a company that claims to be able to repair the existing frames for a fraction of the cost of new windows. Graham, though, isn't hugely optimistic about his other half's plan. So, hang on, you're, you're going to fix this? Yes. With... with explain that to me. I, no. I would have thought that was kind of... It's, it's, past it's it. easy fixable. We're getting it down to a sound surface and then we're going to build it up with some of our uh, special uh, glues we use and, and timber. Resin all being treated. Yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah. And will it be as good as new? It'll be better than new. Better than new? Yes. Blimey! I wouldn't have thought you'd be able to fix that, really. That's... I'm looking forward to seeing it. In a couple of hours, and we'll put it to rest. You're, you're worth your wait. <laughs> <laughs> there are millions of sash windows in the UK. There's a chance that you have them in your home. But loads are rotting, just like Sarah's. All they need is TLC and a lick of paint every couple of years. But Sarah's gone all high-tech to keep her sashes sound for the future. The staff bead here, you pop off, and that means that you can take the sash out. Instead of being nailed, they've got a little mechanism which has been fitted with a brake on it. And then you can take it down you can properly paint the window, which means you maintain your windows on a regular basis and save yourself a lot of time and money in the long run. So, with the appliance of a little bit of science and gloss paint, these windows should be good for another hundred years. The window firm have been true to their word and have salvaged something from the window wreckage for less than a quarter of the cost of a new window. So that's one down, just another 148 to go. Good luck, lads. And the reality is this is so big, the house, that any problem anyone would have in any house is likely to be wrapped within these walls. We're going to come across pretty much every problem anyone's ever had. That makes it impossible to calculate the costs of a restoration this size. For someone who for years has been telling people to work to a budget, that sits very uncomfortably with Sarah. Ten years ago, Sarah and Graham bought this tumble-down stately home in Yorkshire for their family to grow up in and have fun. But the building was also at risk, and it's quite honestly become a massive cash albatross. So now they've got to find a way to make it pay for itself. Graham and I had our wedding here, and oh, we thought it was amazing, and I'm, perhaps that is the solution for other people to be able to use it for the same purpose. The hall is desperately run down. Rainwater has got in everywhere and is systematically destroying the interior. Over the years, they've sunk £100,000 on the roof alone. But even that hasn't been enough to make it watertight. 
quite early on after we bought the house we started re-roofing from the front back and and you know that in itself just the front section of the house has cost the same as a normal house just to re-roof it it's it's a very expensive process but there's no point in doing anything underneath if you still got water pouring in but it gets worse and worse and worse the further away you get from where we are standing now that's all the cutting yeah. it, Jeff. is that that yeah that feel better for that one the problem here is that on these valley sections the, the lead's that old, it's perished. And as you can see here, it's, it's got cracks appearing down the centre of the valley, which water's going to penetrate through no, no trouble. And the ceilings have been done, actually, before the valley's been repaired, so water is damaging the new ceilings. It's easy to ignore your roof, but you do so at your peril. With a bit of regular, low-cost maintenance, it'll keep you dry for decades. But the roofs at Rise haven't been that lucky. And now they need some serious TLC to keep the Yorkshire wind and rain out. If you see any slipped slates, make sure that you get someone to come in quickly and sort it out before the problem gets worse. It's, it doesn't cost very much to do. You must keep your gutters free of leaves. That's really essential. Here you can see there's lots of leaves that have landed in this gutter. Is anyone down there? Sorry. <laughs> the work fixing the main roof seems to be in hand. But just as one problem is solved at Rise, another one pops up to take its place. Over at the gym, come wedding reception venue, there's a serious problem. I mean, obviously it's leaking, we can yep. see that from the inside, but what do you reckon about the roof? The roof's probably been on 15, 20 years. So you, you're getting towards the end of the useful life of the, the membrane anyway. If it's not rectified soon enough, the deck eventually will fail. Disintegrate. Disintegrate. So you mean collapse. the roof will collapse? Yeah, basically, eventually. What are we talking about in terms of money here? If you're stripping it off and putting a new deck in place, it's several tens of thousands of pounds. OK, that's brilliant, because we've got about 300 quid aside yeah. for that, haven't we? <laughs> To be honest, that's not going to be something that we're able to do. What, what, what are the alternatives? There must be an alternatives in the terms alternative of... The alternative is to overlay over. what you've got there, mm -hmm. uh, which would... In, basically, what you'd have to do is you'd have to take all the moss and lichen growth off and Oops. then follow it through with, with uh, felt over the top. What sort of figure are we talking on on that, do you think? Materials costing is roughly around £15 a square metre. Okay. We're uh, talking for a about system. 200 square metres of roof there, aren't we? Yeah, roughly. So we're probably talking about with labour, five grand or something like that. Uh, it's probably, probably been more than that, to be honest. It's the classic restoration dilemma. Bust the budget for the permanent fix, or just patch it up to save some cash. For Sarah and Graham, who are already struggling to keep the budget in check, it has to be the latter. A house like this is a money pit. You could get rid of a million pounds like that on this house. It would be easy peasy. Whenever they can, Sarah and her gang slip up the M1 for a little R&R &R at Rise Hall. Often they're joined by her brother, Dickon, and his brood. The two families are very, very close indeed. Dickon happens to be married to Graham's sister. So I mean, that, that yeah. isn't actually yeah, yeah. illegal. All of the children are all very fond of each other, so they tend to play as a pack, which makes life terribly convenient for parents. Mm. So it's not really uh, a hardship to bring them all here. Sarah and Graham have run a property development business with Dickon for many years and value his opinion. Although you get the feeling he may be being somewhat diplomatic when it comes to his thoughts on the sports hall. This is going to be a lovely room and it doesn't need anything very much more than tables laid up on it. If the, roof, if the ceiling's tented, that's going to be yeah. enough. Graham, however, is less convinced by Dickens' silver tongue. You think people would be won over for their wedding day? Probably, I, th I agree, 40s, 50s, I think maybe they'd just be fine. It's a bit quaint, it's a bit crappy. But a wedding... I think those windows look shit. 
I, I think you've got to put French doors. Those ones on the top, I don't think you notice. I think if things are getting a bit stressful, it's no surprise. Sarah gave birth to her fourth child three weeks ago, and the lack of sleep might just be taking its toll. It certainly adds a little extra frissons of stress having a three-week-old baby and three other children. And I mind you, in comparison to the house, they're really quite easy. Really? <laughs> Or oh, trade them in for the house any time. <laughs> <laughs> like all men, Graham likes to finish one job before starting another. So with his hastily dug pond, now a rather nice landscaped lake, it's time for a family outing to find some fish. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah, look, look, look. Yeah. Do you think they've got fish fingers in there as well? <laughs> <laughs> All this fishy business is going right over baby Laurie's head. You're going to catch fish. OK, come on, everybody, this way. Slowly, slowly, slowly. If we just hold, we just hold it here. What's going on in this net here? Oh, oh, wow. oh. There, there he is. Oh, yeah. There he is. Whoa! Oh, fishing, boys. <laughs> fish picked. It's off to Rise Hall and their new stately lake. Ollie and Theo are going to put the whale in. To call that big, big whale. Oh. <laughs> Come on, then. Hang on, wait, listen, stop Everyone it. Everyone give stop, him stop. a kiss. Oh, OK, push him in. Oh, no. hey, off he goes. There he is. Oh, there he is. Look. This is the culmination of Graham's dream, really. It's now, <laughs> it's now not only a pond, but it's stocked with fish. Now he's going to spend many, many evenings trying to get the fish back out again. Honestly, I'm going to get away from the family and come down and pretend I'm fishing <laughs> or smoking fags or doing something. <laughs> A couple of weeks later, and Sarah and Graham are once again making the gruelling round trip from London to Rise and back. It's only 6am, but the kids have already been handed over and the grown-ups are off to King's Cross. I think what's really hard is that on a day that long, we actually only get four hours on site. It's sort of frustrating that you have to have such a long day and achieve so little in the middle of it. Oh, and can you write down 3.30? We're meeting that. Um... I've got that down. Shit, Nick Marshall is his name. It's a really tough start, and their day isn't going to get any easier. This is better. Hello. The radiators Sarah ordered months ago haven't arrived. And it's so damp, all the work at the back of the house has had to stop. It's a bit of a disaster. I'm oh. really sorry they've taken so long. Radiators, have you sorted those yet, are they? I'm, I'm in the process of, of discussions about them because they assured me they'd been ordered and would be delivered before Christmas. Yeah. So then I kept ringing every couple of days. I went to the top, top of it yesterday and said, look, all I need to no. Are the radiators coming? Yeah, or not. Or not coming. Yeah. Because, <laughs> to be quite honest, yeah. we need some radiators. The worst comes to worst, I'm going to make a decision by the end of the day, yeah. today, and if the worst comes to worst, we'll just go with the original. So I'm really sorry, because oh, so right. I only waited for three months patiently with a smile. <laughs> uh, I've still got and... the email that says, all radiators and bathrooms will be delivered by 28th of I October. Know, Guaranteed. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. It's not just the radiators. Today, only half the taps for the back bathrooms have turned up. Hitting the June deadline is looking increasingly unlikely. No. Two arrived and four didn't. Yeah. Bath tank, put the bath on the legs, the legs on the bath. Okay. And put the, the waist, overflow so. and the waist on. But obviously without the taps, I can't put them into oh, the I position. I appreciate it's not ideal. So. Let me just call them right this second and see how quickly we can get all this. They're going to slow you up, mate. It slightly slows up, yeah. But that's nothing new. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah may be having a slow day at the back of the house, but round the front, Graham and decorator Karen are cracking on with the big paint job. It looks really nice with the white, though. 
Them, them heaters was making a difference, but it's still not working. It just must be really, really cold. You know, the walls are that thick and... Yeah. <laughs> Shut the door. It is hard work. A lot of, a lot of decorators won't even tackle it, I don't think. Not, not these days. They're like, they're easy, no preparation, straight in, straight out jobs, like your Barrett Homes or something like that, you know what I mean? Whereas this, you know, it's a task. It is a task, but... It's satisfying. With Sarah project managing from London, Karen tries to keep the boys in line when Miss Beanie's away. But today, Sarah's here on site and unhappy with the lad's lack of locking up. Do they know how to lock them up? Yeah, yeah, she saw them to put the bar across there and leave out that door. And they didn't do it? No, they're not doing it. I'll talk to them. Thanks, yeah, Karen. No worries. The guys, uh, they left the doors wide open and didn't bother locking up. To add to the tap, radiator and security problems, there's another hitch, the sash windows. There's a lot of windows that are meant to have been done all down that side that are missing, that aren't in. There's a lot of them back in, though. Some are back in. It's those three that are missing on that side, which means they can't do the panelling. Well, it's a bit disappointing, because we... I would have liked the windows to be back in, because that's really going to start holding things up. They can't panel around the windows, they can't decorate. Yeah, not ideal. Too many problems, not enough time. And poor Sarah's already heading back to London. The schedule has slipped massively, but it's probably because it was a completely ludicrous schedule in the first place. Um, and now I'm on my way back home, having left Graham and Rise. He'll stay there the night. Um, because he just hasn't got everything done that we need to get done, but um, someone's got to go back to look after the kid. Oh, God, look at me. That was so sad, isn't it? I can't, can't stop yawning. But someone's got to go back and uh, take over poor Pam, who's had the kids since 6 o'clock this morning, and I should think is tearing her hair out now. So I need to go back and let her go home. but I want to see the kids anyway, I can miss them. The list of problems and unfinished jobs at Rise gets longer every day. If Sarah was on site, she might have a fighting chance, but life and family means she has to project manage from London. Could this be the fatal flaw? Sarah and Graham have bitten the bullet and taken on the massive job of restoring their crumbling 97-room pile in East Yorkshire. After decades of neglect, they're determined to save the house from falling down and find a way to get it to pay for itself. Their grand plan is to turn Rise into a top-of-the-range wedding venue. Only problem is, they haven't got a clue how to run a wedding. So they're off to the National Wedding Show for some inspiration. How much is it if you take the whole house and the 22 bedrooms I above? can't give you a price for the inclusive of the bedrooms, but to hire us is 7,500 on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday and bank holidays. So, so per night, for one, for one For one night. One exclusive night. And then extra for extra the bedrooms? Extra for the bedrooms, yeah. Is it sort of full most of the time? We're, well, we, we do about 150 weddings a year. Joking. Maybe weddings really could save Rise Hall. Time for a bit of mental arithmetic. But you have to think, that's three weddings a week, isn't it? That's a really fast turnaround. Oh, bloody hell. Oh, 50 times. That could be around a million pounds a year. But if they're going to get anywhere near that kind of money, Rise Hall will have to be a totally top-notch venue. You know, actually, all we need to do is to look around where we are. People take their weddings so seriously. So it's £11,000 for dinner. That's including dinner. the food, isn't yeah. it? 
Yeah, and why? Yep, yeah, drinks package, three course meal, room hire for the wedding breakfast in our main restaurants. How much are the rooms per night if you want to stay on top? They start at £145 bed and breakfast. £145 okay. bed and breakfast. So you're talking Brilliant. about. That's per room. Weddings are a multi billion pound business. At these prices, it's no surprise. When I went to and um, looked at one, which was a hotel, and they had a number of bedrooms, and that was 25 grand for the whole thing, all in. And there was no sort of apology. She was just going 25 grand, isn't that good value? And I was there going 25 grand. <laughs> <laughs> This is what I should have got married in. I feel like, what do you think? Oh my lord, you look like a proper princess. Yeah. I've always, you see, we didn't, we didn't do any of this at our wedding. The usually incredibly practical couples seem to be losing touch with reality. I think if I'd never come here, I wouldn't have found some aeroplanes that fly through the sky and, and then trail a heart. Oh my goodness, like that. really? Yeah. Now that's genius. <laughs> a lot of these places do slightly feel like it is a hotel. It's not like staying in someone you know's house, and that's what we want it to feel, that you're... Someone else's house where the water doesn't work. Well, yeah, but that's part of it. And there's a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> but that is, it's that shabby, chic, chic charm. I'm sure they will find hundreds of people wanting to pay through the nose for it. Graham is ever the optimist. At the moment, he and Sarah are the proud owners of a damp, dry rot infested money pit. Back at Rise, the lads are trying to patch up the leaking gym roof, but the weather's not helping. We're taking the old chipboard off the uh, flat roof because when water gets through the green mineral on a, on a chipboard roof, it goes like a Weetabix, all pappy and soft. Checking the joists, making sure there's no rot in the actual structure of the roof. Is it ideal weather for this sort of work? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it, you can do it in this because you're stripping, and we know that the ceilings below are damaged anyway, so unless it gets too heavy and it's laying, you know, three inches thick, then we get out of it and abandon it. And abandon it they will because this is Britain's worst winter in 30 years. <laughs> it's decided to snow, which is, which is really quite annoying, actually, because um, the, most of the trucks can't get here. The roofers can't get on the roof because there's so much snow. We were planning on having a lot of people here this, this week. The kids might love the snow, but it's having a massive impact on the budget, schedule and morale. Can we order any bathrooms to the back of the house to keep those guys going? To be honest with you, if you give me half an hour, I can talk to you about the bathrooms to the back of the house and give you a pretty good list. I'm, I'm sitting here. Yeah? I can't stand not making decisions, so I'm, I like to make them. I like to make them quickly and I like to get on. Well, you're going to be sitting there for half an hour doing nothing. Can't guarantee I'll be sitting here for half an hour. Well, I probably wouldn't sit there for half an hour. Where's that list that I gave you of all the bathrooms that we needed? Graham is much more fastidious than me, and he makes... He'll take forever making decisions, but they'll always be the right decisions. Uh, and um, what are we going to do about the basin oh, in that room? Second meal. <laughs> so boring. Sad <laughs> <laughs> so boring, our bathroom audience then needs to sleep. The whole project is grinding to a halt. They may have got the scaffold up, but there's no one on site to use it. It's a disaster. We're trying to sort out a job that's really a two-year job in six months. And if you lose a sixth of that, you know, it's really tricky and we're, in, you know, it's just, it's a real pain in the ass. The project was already tough, but the bad weather may have made it impossible. The snow has just, and the cold has just had an effect on, on everything that we've done. It means we can't take the roof off the sports hall, which means we can't get on with that. You know, we've got to do the floor. Everything's got to be done in stages. And on so much of this, we haven't been able to do the first stage. And 
you know, everyone will say, well, it's not because of the snow, is it? It's because you're crap. All they can do is wait and hope. But with the forecast set to be the same for weeks, it looks like their dreams for a late spring wedding are on ice. Next time. No, 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 no. <laughs> Graham gets a bit of a shock. That's what daddies were made for. How cold? Sir, Shit, I think there's a car here. Bollocks. The first potential customers come for an inspection, <laughs> and the work on the grand staircase finally begins.